Thanks, Matt. So what I'm going to talk tonight about is the fact that we recognize uh, eating disorders as a true addiction like we do opioids or alcohol or tobacco or other behaviors. And I want to start off by describing how people see a relationship with food and how they act towards food. So this is uh, stolen from different uh, books on the internet. Some people fight battles with guns and tanks. Others use spoons and kitchen utensils. I remember the Battle of the Bulge. The Ponderosa salad bar suffered a six-plate defeat. I remember a war with a chocolate Easter bunny. In the middle of the night, I bit its head off. I admit it. I was a food addict. My life was controlled by food. Moderation was never my strong point. When it came to ice cream, one scoop was never enough. I once ate a two-and-a-half-gallon tub of maple walnut ice cream. It almost froze my stomach. To make matters worse, it was my roommate's ice cream. I felt so badly afterwards that I put a 12-foot chain through the handles of the refrigerator and cupboards and told my roommate, here's the key to your food. He wasn't impressed. And this is from the book Overeaters Anonymous, and this is a version of step two, which is also in the big book of Al Alcoholics Anonymous or alcohol. We have driven miles in the dead of night to satisfy a craving for food. We've eaten food that was frozen, burnt, stale, or even dangerously spoiled. We have eaten food off other people's plates, off the floor, off the ground. We have dug food out of the garbage and eaten it. We have frequently lied about what we have eaten, lied to others because we didn't want to face the truth ourselves. We've stolen fruit from our fence. We have also stolen money to buy food. We've eaten beyond the point of being full, beyond the point of being sick of eating. We have continued to overeat, knowing all the while we were disfiguring and maiming our bodies. And another version of eating disorders we'll be talking about tonight is anorexic, and this is uh, from a teenager. I don't see what they tell me they see in the mirror. My cheeks are too full. My hips and thighs are too wide and round. My arms carry too much fat, and my stomach bulges. Looking in the mirror is a daily torture that I allow myself because who can resist the temptation of that reflective sheet of glass, of glimpsing who they think they are? I'm afraid. Someone please tell me there's a better way because I just don't know where to turn or what to do. I'm 15 and I will join the ranks of those who call themselves anorexic. So we're going to talk tonight about what eating disorders are, if they're really addictions, and a little bit about what addiction is, and just a little bit about neurobiology, what parts of the brain are involved. And then we're going to look at um, overeating first, definitions of obesity, the consequences of overeating and undereating and purging, and treatment, and a little bit about brain scans, and then we're going to turn it over to Lori to talk about other treatment modalities. Now, when I, whenever you give this talk, you're asked to fill out a form at the end, and when I first started giving this talk, I give this talk, and I also give one on the physiology of addiction. I found that I was emphasizing all the, the bad things and the physiology and the consequences, and <clears throat> this was one statement that somebody wrote down saying I'm very depressing. So I thought, well, I'm going to spice it up a little bit. And then after I spiced it up, the next comment was, I left tonight entirely without any hope. <laughs> so I, I realized I was probably not doing it the right way. So I, I, uh, I know this sounds a lot like doom and gloom, but this is a treatable disorder. Both of us are going to talk about treatment. Uh, and it's something that is entirely treatable. It's not curable, just like alcoholism is not curable, but it is treatable. So first off, eating disorders have nothing to do with weight. You can have a horrible eating disorder and be normal weight or underweight. You can be severely overweight and not have an eating disorder. It depends on what the etiology is. And we talk mostly about anorexia as being someone who restricts their food and has a distorted image of themselves. Bulimia, somebody who may overeat but compensates by purging or using laxatives or overexercising. 
And then finally, this is not recognized by the psychiatrist, but most people recognize that there's a binge eating disorder and also different variants of it that we'll talk about. So first off, anorexia nervosa. This is a condition where you refuse to maintain what we, quote unquote, consider a normal weight. And this is usually somebody who has a BMI, body mass index, that's more than 15% below normal. So if you consider a BMI of 19, we'll show you what that is, then you're usually talking about people who have BMIs of 17, 15, or even lower. It's someone who has what we consider a pathological fear of weight gain, someone who is terrified of approaching a normal weight. They have a very distorted body image. You'll see pictures of men and women who are starving, usually women, and when you ask them, how do you look to yourself, they'll describe somebody who's obese, even when they're close to death. If you're female, part of the requirements for this definition is that your periods need to have stopped, but that's not usually hard to accomplish when you've lost enough body weight. And there are two types. There's a restrictive, and that's what we usually think about, someone who refuses to eat. And there's also somebody who kind of crosses over the line to binging and purging. So somebody may overeat, they'll force themselves to throw up or use laxatives, but they have the other criteria here also. Now bulimia is somebody who overeats typically and feels like they're losing control when it happens. They may be underweight, normal weight, or overweight. And they have what we call compensatory behavior. So if I binge, I'm going to compensate by starving myself, by making myself throw up, by using laxatives, by exercising, um, and it's something that I use to compensate. And it's supposed to happen twice a week for three months. That's what usually when you see a psychiatric diagnosis, there's a frequency that has to be in there. And it's somebody who is unhappy with their body size or their body shape. And then we have the one that most of us talk about most typically, and that's a binge eating disorder. This is somebody who eats compulsively, and compulsively means that I have to do it to feel normal. I'll eat to the point of being full, I'll eat to the point of being sick, and I won't stop. Because I feel bad about doing it, I'm going to eat alone, and I'll hide things from you. And you may wonder why I'm overweight when you never see me eat, because I do it alone. And this is somebody who eats beyond the point of feeling comfortable, and they feel <clears throat> all these great terms at the bottom, disgusted, depressed, or guilty. And that's how people typically feel about themselves. And there's also one special version called night eating disorder, where somebody may have a normal eating pattern, but they must get up at night, and they must go to the refrigerator, and they must eat. I know a gentleman who, um, in Overeaters Anonymous, who actually had his bedroom locked from the inside, so he couldn't leave the bedroom, gave his wife the key, he would wait until she went to sleep, and then he would sneak under the pillow and steal the key, and go down, eat, come back up, lock the door, and put the key back under her pillow. And she couldn't figure out what was going on. So. These sound like very abnormal behaviors, but you can have an abnormal behavior without being an addict. So the next thing to look at is, are these eating disorders really what we consider to be addictions? So let me back up one more step and ask you what you think addiction is. You would be amazed at how many different definitions you're going to get from people when you ask about addiction. You would be horrified when you ask doctors what they think about a definition of addiction is. And I teach uh, medical school down at Wayne State, and I teach out here. And I'll typically ask residents or medical students, you know, give me a definition of addiction. And it's maybe somebody who's in jail, okay? Um, somebody who can't stop using because they have withdrawal. And it's things that don't really fit what we consider to be the typical definition. So the most common one is that it's physiologic dependence, meaning I can't stop taking Vicodin or whatever because I have withdrawal when I don't take it. And if only I could get over the withdrawal, I'd be okay. Not only do, mo do most patients feel that way, most doctors think that's what addiction is, and it's not. Or it's a lack of willpower. All I have to do is suck it up and stop and everything's going to be okay. Or I'm a bad person. I'm amoral or immoral, meaning no morals or bad morals. And the final definition is that it's a true mental illness like depression, psychosis, bipolar, and everything else. So let's look a little bit, about, look a little bit at these. First off, for physiologic dependence, this definition means you have tolerance and withdrawal. And tolerance means that I have to use more to get the same effect, or I get less effect for what I take. So if I take three or four Vicodin a day to get high, after a few weeks I'll have to take four or five, then five or six, and so on and so on. 
And if I can't get more, then I don't get any effect at all. Withdrawal is the opposite effect of what happens when I stop taking the drug. So if I'm drinking every night to feel relaxed, if I stop drinking suddenly, I'll have the opposite effect. I'll be jittery, anxious, and irritable, won't be able to sleep, exactly the opposite of what the beer was doing for me. However, neither one of these have anything to do with addiction. I can take anybody, everybody in this room and force feed you morphine for a month and then stop suddenly. Everybody in the room will get physically sick. You'll have cramping, diarrhea, flushing, sweating, shakes, and you'll be sick for probably three, four days. And then you'll be over the physical withdrawal. Ninety-five percent of you, or 85, 95 percent of you will say, thank God that's over, I'm going to kill that guy. About 15 percent of us will go out and start rubbing party stores to get more morphine because we have activated the true, true disease of addiction, which means that I now crave it, I have to have it to feel normal, I can't stop taking it, and I use it despite consequences. And that's the difference between simple withdrawal and the disease of addiction. How about lack of willpower? Here are four gentlemen who are alleged to have problems with drugs and alcohol. The two on the left were alleged to have problems with amphetamines. The two on the right were alleged to have problems with alcohol. The exception is the guy in the top right, Winston Churchill. They said he was not an alcoholic because no alcoholic ever drank that much. When he was a supreme commander of the Allied forces and running World War II, he was drinking about a fifth a night. Okay? But no one has ever accused any of these four of having a lack of willpower. Now, there's millions of examples, and what I tried to do was I tried to balance Republicans and, and Democrats on this slide, but you can say what you want about these gentlemen, but no one has ever accused them of being weak-willed. So who's the guy on the, on the right? All you got to do is recognize the cigar. Okay, who's the guy on the left? The guy on the left is the father of American cancer surgery. His name is William Halstead. He invented the radical mastectomy. If you go and talk to a surgeon, this is God. Okay? And what they don't talk about is this guy was a horrible cocaine addict. Not only was he addicted, but he got his fellows addicted and his colleagues addicted, and I can only imagine what rounds were like with him in the morning. Okay? And he's only published one paper, and Matt um, circulated it around on the internet a couple of years ago, and it is completely unintelligible. The first sentence is uh, like a page and a half long. He was high when he wrote it. He never wrote anything else. And people can talk about being an immoral person, but this guy is actually revered as like being close to God if you're a surgeon. So what we're left with is talking about addiction as a mental illness. And the culprit is the red splotch in the middle of the brain, and that's called the nucleus accumbens. Nucleus means a collection of brain cells, and everything else is Latin. Okay, and this is your pleasure center in your brain. And the drug that your pleasure center responds to is dopamine. When I see a piece of cake, my brain releases dopamine and makes me crave it. When I eat that piece of cake, my brain releases more dopamine and I get a reward and I crave more. Now in someone who's normal, that response, that circular response, gets tamped down. My front of my brain, which we'll show you, will say, okay, you've had enough, go home. In addiction, that circle just takes off and you crave it, you eat it, you crave it, you eat it, or you crave it, you drink it, or whatever it is, and you can't stop. The space behind the nucleus accumbens, the blue spot, is called the ventral tegmental area, and that's the gas tank. The gas tank supplies dopamine to the nucleus accumbens, and that is your actual reward circuit. That's what makes you enjoy and crave different things. Now here is a different picture of a rat brain and on, the, on your right side is the frontal cortex, okay? And on your left side is the hindbrain, which is responsible for automatic or autonomic functions that take place whether you're conscious or not. In between that is the midbrain and the primitive brain. And there's a very small cortex because this is a mouse or a rat. My boss also says this is an OB-GYN's brain because I'm also an OB-GYN. But what you're looking at is the yellow area is the nucleus accumbens. The blue area is the ventral tegmental area, and all the drugs we're going to talk about tonight feed either directly or indirectly on the nucleus accumbens by releasing dopamine. And that's really the bottom line. If you're talking about an addiction, it's mediated through dopamine. 
just to bring it up, if you look at the back here, this area here, it's not working. Well, back here, when you look at the bottom, it says locus ceruleus, and this area here is the withdrawal center. That's the area that kicks in when you take pain pills for a while and stop. Your withdrawal center is in the back of your brain. Your nucleus accumbens is towards the front of your brain. But the nucleus accumbens is still considered to be a primitive part of the brain. Now, this is a picture of a brain looking like I've cut my head off right about here, and I'm looking down straight onto it. And remember, this is your brain is a mirror image of itself. So you're looking at the pleasure center straight down. The red area is dopamine. And if you look on the left, you can see three normal people, three control subjects, and they have a lot of red in their brain. That means they have a lot of dopamine, and they're normal, and they're happy. If you look at the three people on the right, you've got a cocaine addict, an alcoholic, and a heroin addict, and they all share the same features. The dopamine is gone. There's no red there, or very little red there. And this is one theory of addiction, that addicts have less dopamine so they feel terrible, so they spend all their time catching up and trying to build their dopamine up. Now, obviously, there's a big hole in that argument. Maybe all you're looking at is a picture of brain damage. I mean, if you use drugs, whoops, hold on. If you use drugs, you damage your brain and you burn out your dopamine. I'm going to show you a slide at the end that shows how that is not true. So we'll come back to that. If you go to an, a 12-step meeting, and I would recommend that anybody who has anything to do with addiction go to an open talk of a 12-step meeting. There's a fantastic AA talk here, Saturday night, 8.30. The public is welcome. You will hear somebody share their story, and you will always hear them say some version of the sentence. I felt like I didn't belong in my own skin. I felt less than. I felt different. There's something wrong with me. I wanted to leave the room. And what they're describing is dysphoria or decreased hedonic tone. Hedonic tone is the basal level of pleasure that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is decreased in addicts and alcoholics. And this is a picture that was sent around the internet a few years ago by Jim Balmer. And what you're supposed to do is look at this and pick out the future alcoholic. People always look at the bottom. Down there, that's Matt on the lower left, OK? And these are the kids in the bottom are normal, happy kids. Like one or two of them may go to prison for something, but they're having a good time, okay? Look at the girl in the top row. Look how intensely unhappy she looks. And obviously this is all contrived, but the idea here is if she is unhappy because she has decreased hedonic tone, because she has less dopamine, she will learn that she can use a drug or gamble or sex or internet or something, and she can join her friends in the front. Eventually she'll have to do more and more to get less and less, and she won't be able to hang out with her friends in the front anymore. And that really is a natural history of addiction. So if you go to an addictionist or a psychiatrist and you want to find out if you have addiction, they're going to go through this list with you. They're going to ask you seven, seven things. You have to have three of them in the past year to qualify. Do you have to take more? Do you have withdrawal when you stop? Do you take more than you planned on? Do you find that you can't cut down and you can't control your use? Do you spend all your time getting it, using it, or recovering from it? Do you give up everything else in your life to get it? And do you use it by a physical or a psychiatric problem? If you have three of those seven within a year, then whatever it is we're talking about, and it can be a behavior or it can be a drug, I'm going to say that you're addicted. Okay? Now, we, we don't have time to talk about it tonight, but the problem is that a lot of behaviors kind of cross the line with this, and one of them is chronic pain. People with chronic pain often behave like they have addiction, but they don't. They just have uncontrolled pain. So there's a better way to look at it, and it's called the four C's. When you don't have it, you crave it. You have to use it just to feel normal. I'm not talking about having an eye opener. I'm talking about if I don't have a drink tonight when I get home, I'm going to be a monster. You can lose control. So when I plan on just having one or two drinks, I might up wind, up, wind up having 20. And I'm going to use despite consequences. So despite losing my family, my job, my home, whatever, I'm going to keep on using. And I like to throw in a fifth C, which is chronic. This is something that is not diagnosed based on one drunk driving. This is something that usually goes on for quite some time. Now, the problem with addiction is not addiction. If that were true, 
if you had an alcohol problem or a drug problem, all you'd have to do is get arrested, be put in jail, and when you get out from jail, the withdrawal's over and everything's okay. The problem is that addicts relapse. Now, why do they relapse? There's three reasons. The drug, stress, and cues. So I may pick up my 30-day chip this weekend and go out and have a beer to celebrate. It sounds insane, but people do it every day. I may find myself under so much stress that I'm going to have a drink, even though I recognize that the stress is caused by my drinking. It happens every day. Or I may walk by a bar on the way home tonight, and I hear that sound, and I hear that smell that smell, and I'm right in the bar, and before I know it, I'm drinking again. And this is something that people say, well, this is just your weak will. This is all made up. This is nonsense. This is not science. So here's what they found. There's different parts of the brain that trigger those three different kinds of relapse. If I have one beer and wind up drinking a case of beer, that is triggered by my ventral tegmental area. We said that was the gas tank for dopamine. If I'm under too much stress and I relapse, that's triggered by an area that releases what's called corticotropin releasing factor, which eventually can raise my cortisol level. And if I walk by the bar and find myself walking in, that's triggered by two parts of my brain that are right up in the top there. They're known as the hippocampus and the amygdala. These are all old Latin names that don't make any sense. But that's the part of my brain that deals with memory. So I walk past the bar and I remember what it used to be like. I forget about what it really used to be like and I go in and, and start drinking. Now there's other parts of the brain involved that we're not going to have time to talk about. There's an area right above the nucleus accumbens that deals with craving. We mentioned the amygdala. We mentioned the hippocampus. The frontal cortex is a part of my brain that's supposed to tell me not to do this. So those of you who decide to go out tonight and have a couple beers, and after two beers you stop because you don't want to get a drunk driving ticket, that's your frontal cortex inhibiting your pleasure center. In the addict, not only is the pleasure center out of control, the frontal cortex is broken. And one phrase is, the lights are bright, but nobody's home. And that's actually how it works. Your brain simply is not functioning. And then when we're talking about eating disorders, there's also the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is supposed to tell you when you're full. It kind of shuts off when you have an eating disorder. Now, talking about chemicals, we've mentioned dopamine. Dopamine is the pleasure drug. It makes you crave something and rewards you for, for using it. There are other ones. There's serotonin, which calms you down. And everyone's heard, <coughs> everyone's heard of SSRIs. Those are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They increase serotonin in your brain and they relieve depression. There is endocannabinoids, which are the munchy receptors. So that's the part of your brain that binds marijuana and that will increase your appetite. And we'll talk about a drug that actually worked to block that, but they had to take it off the market. There's endorphins, which are your natural pleasure drugs. So when you go running, when you have a baby, anything that's very stressful, you release endorphins and you get a natural high. That makes you eat. And then there are two hormones that fight each other. There's leptin and ghrelin. Leptin is a drug that is anorexigenic, which means that it inhibits your appetite. And ghrelin is orexigenic, which means it stimulates your appetite. And these two chemicals can be abnormal in someone who has an eating disorder. Now, if you go to a 12-step meeting for food, which the typical ones around here are going to be food addicts in recovery or overeaters anonymous, you're going to hear people warn you that when you share your story, don't talk about food because it can trigger somebody. When you go to an AA meeting, you'll hear people talk about don't become hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. They're covering the relapse triggers. They're covering exposure to the cues. They're covering stress, and they're preventing you from being exposed to your drug. It's the same thing. Now, the first time I heard this at a 12-step meeting, someone said, I'm cross-addicted. I had no idea what it meant. I thought, well, maybe you're talking about religion. But they're not. They're talking about someone who can flip addictions. It happens every day. So someone will be an alcoholic. They'll start going to AA meetings, and their tobacco intake will triple. Their food intake will triple. They'll start gambling. They'll become addicted to the Internet, and their wheels will still come off. Somebody who's an opioid addict will switch to sedatives. So they'll start taking benzodiazepines. It's because the part of their brain that controls addiction is damaged, their nucleus accumbens. So 
you can hear the same thing at twelve step food meetings again there's a way and food addicts and recovery and you'll hear them say the same thing with different words they say that they are addicted to food an abnormal relationship to food and really there's a lot we will show some more brain scans at the end but there's a lot of science here to back that up now take a look at these and see how many of these may trigger your nucleus accumbens this is a great uh, this is Ray Milland in Lost Weekend this is a, a great scene where he decides to go out and have just one drink and winds up going on a bender this is cocaine which is a potent trigger we're going to show you a picture of a cocaine addict's brain when he watches Bambi and looks at a plate of cocaine and there's a going to be a dramatic difference tobacco is an addiction and this always upsets somebody but if you have if you smoke you fulfill pretty much all the DSM criteria and all four or five of the four C's. This is somebody who's spending a little bit too much time down at the Greek Town Casino and this is a very very damaging or very dangerous form of addiction because society will let you sign over your house, your paycheck, your family all in a matter of one night so it can be it can destroy a family very very easily. Anybody who's gotten one of those late night emails from Jim Balmer we snuck in and took a picture of his computer so he's got his gin, he's got his water, he's got his cigarettes, he's got his Pepsi for his stomach and he's settling in for a long night at the computer here. I try not to show this one for too long, people get upset. Okay, so this is written by um, Nora Vokov who is the national, she's the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. She's done a lot of the brain scans that we're going to show you tonight and she's talking about relationship with food. This is also written by Mark Gold who's at the University of Florida. It says the 1960s were, were known as a decade of sex, drugs, rock and roll. Food was an afterthought. It was maybe suppressed by drug taking. The heavier the patient, the less drugs and illegal, less alcohol and illegal drugs they use. So there is an inverse relationship between food and other drugs. Treatment of addicts appears to result in weight gain, all supervised drug abstinence treatment causes weight gain. And that's one reason people smoke so much in recovery because they don't want to gain weight. Loss of control over eating and obesity produces change in the, changes in the brain which are similar to those produced by drugs of abuse. Many obesity researchers focus on body's fuel and fat levels and there's a, if you look it up on the internet there is just an overwhelming amount of information on those hormones I mentioned like ghrelin and leptin but we know that there's a lot more going on when someone is a compulsive eater they are acting like a drug addicted patient and that's what's really going on it's not their hormones either turning their appetite on or off why healthy fast food may not work one locale mandarin almond and watercress salad anything you want with it yep a big mac and some fries so the idea here is that the people can design healthy food but if we have compulsion and craving we're going to wind up ordering the unhealthy food in the end so let's talk a little bit about consequences of obesity first is the definition what's happened in the US and what things are associated with it I'm not going to come out and say that it causes obesity but what things do we know about obesity so this is the dreaded BMI graph I have actually had patients break out in tears when I pull this out in the room you are supposed to be in the blue area on the left that's a BMI of 19 through 25 and BMI is your weight in kilograms divided by your surface area it's a metric measurement on the far left is underweight and the light green is overweight and then there are different levels of obesity and severe obesity is somebody who is either 100 percent overweight or has a BMI greater than 40. Yeah, it's Now, this is what's happened in the U.S. over the past 15 years. If you look at the bottom of the graph, you have light blue, medium blue, dark blue, I guess it's tan, and then light red and dark red, going all the way from less than 10% to more than 30% obese. And you can see looking at 1990 compared to 2005 that major parts of the country have over a third of their population being obese. And let me just show you how this picture changes over the years. Here's 1985, 86, 87, 88, 89, 
2001, we're starting to see the 20 to 40% obese. 2002, 2003, 2004, there's Michigan making the big time, and 2005, okay? It's being estimated that within five to 10 years, 60% of the city of Detroit will be obese. We're not talking about overweight, we're talking about being obese. And that means diabetes, heart disease, strokes, early death, and just completely uncontrollable medical bills. Now, is this all due to genetic addiction? Obviously not. There's more going on to it. And there's a lot of theories saying that the food industry has figured out how to work on our pleasure center and to trap it and trigger it. So they balance foods with the exact amount of salt, um, flour, sugar, fat, in order to trigger our nucleus accumbens even to wanting more. Okay, so what are the known things that may have something to do with obesity? How much your mother took in, whether or not your mother had diabetes, whether or not your mother breastfed you, if you have one or both parents who are obese, if you have decreased energy expenditure, and if you watch TV. Every two hours of TV increases obesity by 25% and diabetes by 15%, okay? Sleep deprivation. People who get less sleep cannot control their eating. People who overeat. Fast food seems to trigger more fast food. And the people who design this fast food are not idiots. There's a reason they supersize something. Because, not because they want you to get your money's worth, it's because they want you to come back for more, okay? And eating disorders can cause obesity. And we mentioned nighttime eating. That's where somebody may have a normal food intake during a day, but they have to eat everything in sight. And this is the, the movie that was out years ago showing how somebody just by spending their entire day at McDonald's imagine, ma managed to completely trash their health in a matter of a few weeks. Okay, so let's talk about the opposite. Let's talk about caloric restriction and then purging and overeating again. So if somebody is anorexic, they will have weak bones. That's either osteoporosis or osteopenia. They can have a heart attack or their heart will suddenly stop from an arrhythmia. They will not be able to think. They'll have brain damage. Their stomach will not work. They'll get constipated, and if you take an anorexic and make them constipated, it makes them insane. They will do anything to get laxatives. Their endocrine profile will change. Their periods will stop. Their thyroid will shut down. They'll have electrolyte abnormalities, and if you correct these too quickly, they'll go into pulmonary edema. Your lungs will fill up with water, and your heart will stop, and you'll be infertile. You become constipated. I mentioned that already. And there's something called refeeding syndrome, where, and I, I actually did this to somebody once. I saw my patient that was getting too close to the edge, put her in the hospital, hooked up an IV, replaced her electrolytes, and she went into renal failure because I replaced them too fast. So you have to be very, very careful, and often these patients will wind up in intensive care to do this. If you're purged, you'll expose your mouth and your teeth to acid. You will burn the enamel off your teeth. You get big salivary glands. You may see somebody that you know who is losing weight and their parotid glands are getting big down here. You'll have a finger sign because your middle knuckle keeps hitting your teeth when you make yourself throw up and you will burn your esophagus out. And I have patients that have had to have their esophagus dilated forcefully to stretch their esophagus back out after being uh, purging. Here's a gentleman who has what's called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a unique combination of things that probably is leading to diabetes. It's three out of these five. You have to have a waist circumference greater than 40 if you're a male, or 35 if you're a woman. Your triglycerides, which is your fat in your blood, must be high. Remember, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Good cholesterol is HDL, bad cholesterol is LDL. You have low HDL and high LDL. You have high blood pressure and you have high glucose. If you have three of these, then you have metabolic syndrome and you need treatment. What else goes along with eating disorders? There's a very high incidence of a sexual and physical abuse, especially in women who have eating disorders. There's a family history. They will have other psychiatric disorders, which we're gonna talk about in a second. 
and there's other addictions. This is typically with bulimics more than anorexics. You will have other addictions to opiates, alcohol, or sedatives, and it may be an addiction all by itself. So here's a, a case history of somebody, I've changed the details. This is somebody that I admitted to Don Farm several years ago. She's 19 years old, she's coming in for cocaine addiction, and when I was taking her history, she said, yeah, I used to have an eating disorder, but don't worry about it, <clears throat> I've recovered, no problem. And then she wants laxatives at her bedside. She only wants salad, she doesn't want to eat with anybody else. She wants permission to jog at midnight around Don Farm without any supervision, and she wants extra vitamins, okay? This is a screaming red flag for somebody who has an eating disorder. When you go through her medical records, she had that refeeding syndrome, and she almost died in an intensive care unit. It's a very common story. Okay, a little bad news here. Let's go through the 20 questions that are published by Food Addicts in Recovery. If you answer yes to a cup, more than a couple of these, you may be a food addict. Ever wanted to stop eating and found you couldn't? Do you think about food or your weight all the time? Do you find yourself trying diet after diet with no success? Do you binge and then get rid of the binge somehow? Do you eat differently alone than in public? Do you, does your doctor or family member ever approach you worried about your weight? Do you eat a lot of food at one time? Is your weight problem due to grazing or nibbling? Do they want to put a cowbell on you? Do you eat to escape from your feelings? Do you eat when you're not hungry? Have you ever discarded food only to go back and get it out of the garbage can? Do you eat in secret? Do you fast or severely restrict your food intake, especially after you binge? Have you ever stolen somebody else's food? Have you ever hidden food to make sure that you had enough and didn't want anybody else to know? Do you feel driven to exercise excessively after you binge? Do you obsessively calculate the calories you've used up? Do you feel guilty or ashamed about what you've eaten? Are you waiting for your life to start when you lose weight, quote unquote? And do you feel hopeless about your relationship with food? If I plugged in alcohol or drugs for these questions, it would seem entirely normal. But this is talking about simple food. Same thing. How about treatment? First off, caloric restriction, regular old diets. If diets worked, nobody would be here tonight, so we can discard those. Psychotherapy, I'm going to leave that to Lori, but there are many effective forms of psychotherapy. There is spiritual treatment, which is a 12-step program we're going to talk about. There's food, ad food Addicts in Recovery, Food Addicts Anonymous, and Overeaters Anonymous. There is medical, and these are drugs that are usually used for things like seizure disorders. There's antidepressants, there's stimulants, amphetamines, anti-epileptic drugs, that's AED, there are the munchie blockers, which are the CBIs, and the dopamine inhibitors, which we're going to talk about. Remember, dopamine is the pleasure drug. And finally, there's gastric bypass surgery that we're going to talk about. First off, for spirituality. Now, when, I, when I'm seeing someone in my office, and I get to this point, this is where I see someone's eyes roll up, okay? <laughs> and I talk about a spiritual treatment for their addiction. And they will say, well, you know, I, I had a bad experience with my religion during childhood, or I don't believe in God, and what I'll say is, give me an example of a spiritual program where somebody turns himself over to a higher power, takes direction, and does what they're told, and gets their life back. And they'll usually say, well, well Alcoholics Anonymous, that's a bunch of sissies. And I'll say, okay, but I've got one other suggestion. The United States Marine Corps, okay? When you read the Marine Corps motto, it essentially is talking about spirituality. And this is, we, Kathy and I took this picture, I think, out in Grand Rapids. This is a commitment to something greater than themselves. That is the definition of spirituality, plain and simple. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with religion. This is spirituality. And 12-step programs utilize that same spirituality. And that's something that I use when someone, you know, starts feeling guilty or feels bad about their religion or something else that happened. And again, we've talked about this already, Food Addicts in Recovery, Overeaters Anonymous, and there's Food Addicts Anonymous. There's three groups. Um, FAIR and OA are the big groups here in the Ann Arbor area. The 12 steps of Overeaters Anonymous or FA 
are essentially the same as the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. And we don't really have time to go through them, but the big ones are the first step is you admit you're powerless. The third step is you turn yourself over to somebody or something else. Doesn't have to be God, doesn't have to be religion. The fifth step is you do a moral inventory where you admit your wrongs to somebody, hopefully a sponsor. The ninth step is where you go out and make amends, and that is probably the, the big deal breaker in 12-step programs. People often never do this, and they will eventually relapse. And then there's the 11th step, which is spirituality, and the 12th step, which is carrying the message to others. And it's the same for food, alcohol, opioids, anything else. Okay, how about men? Do men get eating disorders? Okay, this is something where if you go to a 12-step food meeting, you may never see men there, okay? You see women, and that's about it. And men tend to shy away from them. But this is from another book talking about stories about men. Being a man, I learned I was not supposed to worry about my weight. When I stopped drinking alcohol, my weight began to rise, and no matter what I tried, I could not control it. Food had become my alternative to alcohol. In Food Addicts Anonymous, I was able to recognize that certain foods are addictive. I learned how to weigh and measure. I've been able to return to my previous life and how to face life without using food as a drug. The same for men and women. Now, again, I'm going to um, pass on talking about CBT, leave that for Lori, and focus on medications and the more invasive stuff. For medications, almost every drug has been tried. Antidepressants, antipoleptics, antipsychotics, dopamine inhibitors, dopamine agonists, everything has been tried and nothing really has been shown to work except for one drug which got taken off the market, okay? We'll talk about it in a second. You can hospitalize somebody, you put a camera in the bedroom, you put a camera in the bathroom, a camera in the shower, and they cannot go anywhere without being seen, so they can't eat. And if they try and eat, an alarm goes off, okay? And that is something that can be done under controlled conditions, but then when you leave the hospital, you can't do it anymore. And there's o Overeaters Anonymous, which we mentioned. There are stimulants. These are up here mostly to be condemned. These are dangerous drugs. They cause hypertension, stroke, addiction. If somebody has an eating disorder, they already have addiction, and this will often trigger an amphetamine addiction. Um, ephedra was uh, Metabolife. The guy that invented Metabolife died from a stroke from taking Metabolife. That's my water, ephedra. Okay. Cybutramine is a lesser potency stimulant, but it is still a stimulant and it can still have a lot of addiction issues. Again, antidepressants have been tried. All the drugs you hear about with depression have been tried with very, very little success. Now, antipoleptics. There's a drug called Topamax or Topiramate, which is used for seizures, mood disorders, um, and it was found to cause decreased appetite, so people started selling it. And people who take this drug will tell you they often feel very, very confused. And there's something called Topamax brain, which is like being in a fog. And here's an ad from the internet. Take Topamax, which is meant for somebody who has a seizure disorder, and will help you lose weight. Okay? And this can have a lot of serious consequences as well. Now, this was the cure that was. This is Romanobant or Acomplia. This blocks your marijuana receptor, your cannabinoid receptor. And it had a great response. 30% of patients lost 10% of their body weight. That really is all you need to lose to reverse your health consequences. 30% lost that much weight. That's huge compared to any other study. All the amphetamine studies, patients would lose like four pounds, okay? The problem was that every cell in your brain has a marijuana receptor and all kinds of havoc wound up happening and it got yanked for the market for depression and suicide. And it got taken off the market in the U.S. first, and I had all these people calling me and saying, can I get the prescription so I can get it from Canada, and then Europe, and finally the free world shut it down. Now, there's a drug called Vivitrol, which you may have heard of. It's used for heroin addicts, and it blocks your opioid receptors in your brain for like a month at a time. That is the same pathway that you use for reward for food which ties in with your nucleus accumbens. So there are people that are getting these injections, which are about 1,000 to $1,500 a month, to help decrease their appetite. The problem is that if you wind up getting in a car accident, they just can't give you any pain pills. 
and the makers of this drug say, if somebody has an accident and needs surgery, we suggest an alternative to pain medications. They don't say what alternative it is, it's probably just chewing on a stick, but if you get an injury or something or you need surgery, you can be in big trouble with this. All right, the last thing here, surgery, okay, bariatric surgery. What are the indications for offering somebody gastric bypass surgery or gastric banding? It's normally a BMI of 40, which means you're 100% overweight, or a BMI of 35 with diabetes or hypertension. There's a lot of people in that category. In Detroit, it's probably 25 to 35% of the city, okay? You have to have failed medical therapy and you have to be a candidate to have surgery, which means you gotta be able to walk about a block, which can be difficult for some people. What are the contraindications? An eating disorder. How the hell did you get to have a BMI of 40 without having an eating disorder, okay? This is, in my mind, a scam, because they say that you can't have a psychiatric problem to get the surgery, but you really couldn't have the condition unless you had a psychiatric problem in the first place. It's like saying you can't be treated for alcoholism if you have addiction. Okay, but that's there. You can't be using drugs or alcohol. You're probably using drugs or alcohol after the surgery, but you can't be using it before the surgery. And you can't have depression or psychosis. The complication rates are a lot better than they used to be. And it's relatively safe surgery and it does extend your life. It treats diabetes and high blood pressure and it's very effective. There are a lot of complications afterwards, but for many people it's a life-saving procedure. And there's two different types. There's a band where they do a laparoscopic surgery and they put a band around the top of your stomach, inflate the band, and that makes your stomach very small. Or you can have the full-blown surgery where they short circuit your stomach and disconnect your stomach almost completely. This is the one that is more effective. It's also the one that has more complications. But this one is also done with a laparoscope. It can be done with a robot now as well. So, this is the biggest study in the world that I know of. This is called the SOS study. They took a bunch of subjects in Sweden and they randomized them to bariatric surgery or anything else they wanted, including medicine, 12 step, whatever they wanted to do. And they found that the surgery group lost 15% of their weight 10 years later. The other subjects, the medical subjects had gained weight. And this is the one study that says that this really works. Unfortunately, it's the most radical and the most invasive and has the highest complication rate. Okay, let me finish up with brain scans. This is a structure of dopamine. It's very similar to drugs like adrenaline. It's a very, very simple chemical in your brain. And we've already shown this picture. And here's a couple of addicts. On the top, you have a control patient on the left. On the right, you have a methamphetamine addict. It's a very deadly addiction. It burns out your dopamine brain cells. On the bottom, you have a control on the left and another addict on the right. And look what their addiction is food. You can see the same brain picture, the same decreased dopamine in the methamphetamine addict and the obese patient. It's the same. Here is a normal person on the left with normal levels of dopamine and a overweight person on the right with decreased levels of dopamine. Same thing. This is a fancy, fancy graph called the scatcher plot. And just very briefly in English, what it's saying is the receptors for dopamine in your brain, if you're obese, not only are decreased, you've got fewer receptors, they don't work as well. They don't hold on to dopamine as well. So it's a double whammy. Fewer receptors for dopamine and the receptors don't work as well. Now, this is kind of complicated, but this is a picture showing a normal patient and the red is dopamine that has not been released yet. So this means there's not a lot of dopamine activity going on in this control patient. And see what happens here. We take somebody and show them a plate of cocaine. And if you take a cocaine addict and show them, they actually use Bambi on the left, nothing happens. You show them the picture of cocaine and poof, they release all their dopamine. So dopamine's gone now. And what this shows is just the cue of seeing the plate of cocaine could trigger somebody into a relapse. Here is a food addict on the bottom and a normal person on the top. Ignore the part about Ritalin. If you watch Bambi, you've got a lot of dopamine sitting around not doing anything. 
You see the plate of food, you see the Big Mac, and poof, all your dopamine gets released. And what's that do? It makes you want to crave that food. You go out and eat it, and you're off on a binging cycle. Same thing. Now, last thing here is one big hole in all this story is maybe all I'm talking about is brain damage. This study looked at people who were not addicts. They were college students, volunteers. They injected them with IV Ritalin, which most of you would find to be a horrible experience. That's IV amphetamine, mm -hmm. speed. And then they looked at, they asked you, did you like it, did you not like it? And then they looked at your brain scan to see how much dopamine you had. The people who enjoyed being injected with IV amphetamine had lower levels of dopamine. And they weren't addicts. They were born that way. So people who enjoy things like this are abnormal because their brains don't have as much dopamine. I wouldn't try repeating the study at home. It's a little dangerous. OK, it's my favorite picture. This is my wife, Kathy. And this is in the Adirondacks on our honeymoon. And on the right is Tommy. We've been talking about the disease of addiction. Tommy suffers from the disease of stupidity. We got him to be a therapy dog, and we were going to take him down to Children's Hospital and work with the kids in the chemo ward and stuff. We took him to training school, and about halfway through school, the instructor came up and said, we need to talk to you. And she sat us down, and she explained how Tommy just didn't have what it takes, and we should just take Tommy home. He's still a good-looking dog, but he can't be a therapy dog. And last picture of an addict, the dog in the front, is Dakota. Dakota was such a severe food addict that we actually chained our refrigerator. And he would break the lock on the chain after we left the house. And he would empty the refrigerator after breaking the lock. And I realized that he loved food, so when he died, we had him cremated, and he's sitting up on top of the refrigerator now. That's his, his ashes, so he's happy. OK, so let me stop right here. I'd like to really thank Carl. I've seen his presentation maybe three years in a row now, and I laugh every time. I'm thinking whoever said it was depressing likely didn't have enough dopamine um, because it's, so, it's wonderful and still uplifting. So what I have the pleasure and blessing of doing is working with women directly in treatment and some men as well. I've worked with women with binge eating disorder, bulimics, anorexics, and I myself am a recovering bulimic who hasn't purged in 12 years, so I'm proud of that. And I want to talk about what really helps people get recovered, because we can talk a lot about all the treatments, we can talk about how we've gotten here, but we really all need to know what is going to stop the disorder in yourself or in someone that you love. Let's see, we got here. Okay, maybe not on yet. Uh -huh. Okay, we almost got it, I'm sure. Right, there we go. Okay. Okay, first of all, as Carl mentioned, eating disorders are very treatable. They are hard to they are hard to nail down for the same reasons that chemical addiction is hard to nail down where a person is at in their recovery or the cycle of their recovery is a mystery at points. And being able to assess where they're starting is going to depend on how we can treat that. So first we're going to go through a couple things that are locally around for people to start getting themselves educated if they need that, finding resources, finding the people. The ED League of Michigan will allow you to go there, find everybody in the area that treats eating disorders and all around Michigan. It'll help you find doctors. It'll help you find support groups. What's a really nice thing about this resource is each person on the website will give a little bio on themselves so that if you're trying to kind of match yourself up to somebody's personality, it can be really helpful that way. But there is a ton of resources here, and these are the ones that if you're looking in Michigan, you need to have. Here is another local eating disorder organization, the one that I began with, which is the Eating Disorders and Education Network. And I love the two girls up here, Betsy and Lita. They have started programs that are individually put into towns anywhere. So if you're a professional that's here trying to learn to treat eating disorders, 
or somebody who's recovered and would like to help in your own community, you can contact them, get their resources, their work tools, and implement your own recovery group locally in whatever setting is appropriate for you. So this is a really good contact information for professionals. The Center for Eating Disorders here in Ann Arbor is a wonderful place as well. It has everything you need, one-stop shopping. You go there, you can have your nutritionist there, you can have uh, therapy, you can have support groups, and other. they also offer some alternative methods of dealing with your eating disorder, such as uh, body movement or um, image body distortion settings and or trips that you can do to build self-esteem. The University of Michigan is doing lots with eating disorders. If you're a student there, you want to take advantage of the University of Michigan to help you get through. They will have uh, special exceptions for you, as it says right here, that they can you know, make it easier for you to get through with your eating disorder. As well, they do a lot of medical trials and research there so that some people can get free treatment if they don't have any resources. They can go there, get free help just for being part of some of their studies. Anorexic Bulimics Anonymous is a very wonderful tool. Their groups are growing. Their individual groups are growing here in Ann Arbor. However, they're not stabilized enough as we would like them to be as, say, AA meetings are. But what they are offering now is an online conference ability. So you can teleconference into one of their meetings. This is a fantastic way to work the steps within the setting of support groups as well. So I encourage you, if you're really looking to 12-step with this, to call in through their website and try to use that as a tool. Overeaters Anonymous, as Carol was talking, is a fantastic group as well. And this is much more established than a lot of the other ones, more, way more available, like AA meetings are. So it's a good tool to use for that reason alone. It's consistent and strong. The National Eating Disorder Association and ANID, these are two organizations that really are covering all aspects of eating disorders across the board. They're a great tool to go to when you want to find out the politics that are also involved with eating disorders. They will have every kind of resource in your town. They'll have every kind of resource. Conferences will be listed for professionals, helplines. Another, again, another one-stop place to go for resources. Okay? So a lot of resources are out there. That's, that's not something that anybody should not be able to have at their fingertips. We've got the resources. They're there. Eating Disorders, uh, at GERS.com as well, or GERS.com is well known. They have everything eating disorders you could ever want to know in, in book form. So if reading's the way you absorb all your information, go there. It's a wonderful place. Now, treatments. This might look like the depressing part of my little uh, presentation here. The research has not provided us empirically proven treatments for the long-term relief of eating disorders. But this is what I have to say to that. Let's celebrate. Because that doesn't mean anything about the treatment. What it means is that controlling for all of the idiosyncratic examples of eating disorders, for trying to control for all of the relapses, the recovery, these are hard things to control for in a, in a way of testing. These are things that are long-term, like recovering from chemical addiction. We can't track somebody for their lifetime as easily. We can't track them through relapses. We can't control for all of the stressors and environments and stimuli that are going to trigger somebody into a relapse. So it's hard to get the kind of information we need for those kind of long-term studies. There is not going to be a simple answer. But here are some things that are being used. Okay? Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is going to be something that's going to be useful to the person who is really ready to fight their behaviors. And what do I mean by that? For some of us, we're not ready to break habits. 
For some of us, we're in the beginning stages where we're still working on acceptance or understanding the disease or understanding how, uh, how it even happened to us. Cognitive behavior therapy really works well with when we get to the point of I'm feeling better about myself, but I need to still break these habits of going to, you know, going to the kitchen at night or break the habit of restriction or purging, okay? And because there's a twofold side to recovering from an eating disorder, we need to be able to look at both the emotional side and then we need to also look at the habits and the routines as behaviors that have to be broken, habits that have to be broken like anything else. But CBT is good because it gives small, short, goal-oriented tasks to do to work on and gives action-based things. So if you're ready and you're trying to break habits, CBT is going to be a great match. Interpersonal psychotherapy is going to be a good match for somebody who might feel that their life is completely going out of control, not just because of their eating, but because of personal problems that they may be having in their life. And then the two are, you know, very closely wound together. So if you feel like in your life right now that all you're experiencing is drama or pain or emotional suffering, interpersonal psycho psychotherapy is going to be a much better match for you because it immediately treats that first. Sometimes we can't get to the eating disorder until we get a handle on our immediate life and our environment. So if you're feeling that way, interpersonal therapy is a great place to start. Now these emerging treatments, I have 12-step programs up there because I've really become a big believer. After working with women over and over again, I've probably now worked individually with, I'm going to say, maybe just over 300 women and unfortunately only maybe five men in all of that. But 12-step is where my heart has become the strongest now. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. DBT is something they're really starting to apply to eating disorders as well. You can go to Jackson right now and they have a, a center for dealing with eating disorders specifically for DBT. But they also have a DBT center here in Ann Arbor which is also beginning to treat um, eating disorders as well as a myriad of other things with DBT. Um, and acceptance and commitment theory st therapy is still pretty new. We'll go over that. Online support groups and support groups that are around. DBT is a therapy, a behavioral therapy that helps people who have a mood disorder issue within their life that they're dealing with on top of their eating disorder. Uh, DBT is going to help you slow down your thinking, take a, a snapshot of your environment, help you figure out how your mood moved from one place to another. A lot of people deal with feeling that either their anger is going to be something that's out of control for them, their anxiety or their fear, and they come up so fast and they may have a reactionary response to that. DBT is going to be an excellent match for that. It's going to help people slow their thinking down so they can hear their thoughts, read their thoughts, and act on them appropriately to match the environment. Okay. Now, this is the most important part right here. I have this up here, and you should have a handout there that has these five things on it. Do you guys have that? Yes. Okay. So what we got here is the real part of how we get well, which is first assessing where we're at. That is the number one place that I want everybody in here to start when they're thinking about themselves, their loved one, or anybody with an eating disorder. If we don't match where they're really at in their desire to be well, that can really affect how treatment goes. So here are the steps from Prochaska's stages of change. As you can imagine, if somebody's in pre-contemplation or contemplation, these are people who are just talking about how they're annoyed by their eating disorder or it's problematic. They might complain about it, but you can sense that they're really not going to do anything about it. Preparation, somebody in there is going to be educating themselves. 
They're going to be talking finally. They're going to be listening to people. That doesn't mean they're going to be doing anything. Somebody could be here tonight who's in contemplation they just, or in preparation. They just want to think about it, but they're not ready to do anything about it. And, and that form, as you can see, there's plenty of other steps in there, right, under each of those subjects that show and help you know if a person is serious about where they're at. If we're in action, we're doing things. We're doing physical tasks to help us address our eating disorder. And of course, maintaining is, you know, continuing those things till they become second nature. But I want the emphasis for you to be on here because if there are, any, are there any parents in here who are, have a child that they're trying to help? No parents in here? So a lot of things that happen are we're looking at a person and we're saying, we're assuming that because they have an eating disorder, of course they'd want to fix it. That's our first mistake. Do not look at somebody with an eating disorder and assume that they are ready to get rid of it or wanting to get rid of it. It's an addiction. An addiction starts out serving a purpose. It serves a purpose of emotional escape at some point. It serves a purpose of success where there was none. But when you look at that person with an eating disorder, letting go of something like their eating dis disorder is not letting go of a disease for them. Uh, in their early stages, it's letting go of their security. It's letting go of their safety. It's letting go of their friend. So don't make that mistake of thinking that even though they look miserable or feeling miserable, that that means they're ready to let it go. It's better to treat it like they are losing a security blanket and have understanding for that and not, and not let yourself, you know, mis misunderstand that. Because if we don't, we end up trying to push help on them when they're not ready or not give them help that they need because they're in a different spot. Also, we need to be very strong. We need to be very strong when we are facing down these different stages. When somebody's in pre-contemplation or contemplation, uh, their, their non-desire to accept or confront their eating disorder is powerful. They will isolate. They will chase you away. If confronted, they are going to become somebody that you may have never seen before. They can become angry. But they, they, they will do anything to protect that reality and protect that addiction from being taken from them. And that is about these stages. And your understanding of them can help stop damage to yourself or to your family. Because when we're pushing again in a place where there's not readiness, that's how people get hurt. That's how families get broken because they're trying to save somebody who doesn't want to be saved. At each of these steps, there are certain things we can do. If we're stuck with somebody who's in pre-contemplation and contemplation, we have things that you can do to help people move forward. But you want to arm yourself with that knowledge before you try to help them. Get to the people who know what to do. Talk to them so that you're not dragging yourself, draining yourself of the energy of fighting something that nobody wants to fight. So I believe here these are very closely linked to the 12 steps in the sense that, you know, what we're basically saying is when, when we're in preparation or action, we're in acceptance. We've finally agreed that I can't manage this. I can't do this on my own. And so they're very closely linked. Here, I wish they had a ladder on the back of this because they give you that feeling, right, that you start out here, you work your way up, you know, but here if you're not paying attention or doing things or, you know, continuing on your relapse plan, you slide back down the slide. What they don't show you is on the back of there, up there, there's a ladder off the back. So when you do get up there, you can walk down that ladder. You don't have to slide backwards. You can climb off the ladder and you don't have to go back down. So I wish they had that on there. I keep doing that one. Okay. I'm going backwards. Here we go. All right. Now, from an, the, the, these are the key things I pulled out. My problem is I would love to share all of my therapy with you tonight, and we can't do that. You guys probably have personal lives that you need to attend to. So I pull out the things that I feel are the most critical 
or the things that I feel impact my clients the most when we talk about them. The biggest thing, and this also is, this is very much in line with treatment for addiction, is that you don't do it through willpower. Willpower, as Carl was saying, is not the issue. It's not a failure of willpower when your body and your brain is broken. It takes a long time for people to come out of the feelings of failure that they have when they're trying to stop and continually feel like they're failing over and over. Today is the day I'm not, I'm not going to eat anything bad for myself. I'm going to start out the day and breakfast goes great and lunch goes great, but then, you know, you overeat and the day is ruined. Screw it. Same thing happens with people trying to retain themselves from purging. I'm going to try to make it through half the day. It's going to go great. But then they're purging again. And the same with restriction. Willpower does not do it. Breaking habits and learning how to break habits will do it. And letting others help you will do it. Um, we get well, a wonderful woman named Pauline at Dawn Farms Outpatient Services once said, you know, as I listened to her talking to a class of addicts, she said, you don't, you don't get well by working a program. You do it through the help of others. And why is that true? Let's talk about maybe the science behind why that's true. This isn't just a philosophy. The problem is when your brain is broken, it doesn't work right. The thoughts are distorted. The ideas of how to get better are distorted. The ideas of how to get recovery are distorted. If you're not working with other people who can see your distortions and say, wait a minute, no, you're wrong. Isolating isn't going to make it better. No, you're wrong. Keeping, keeping all your pain to yourself isn't going to make it better. We need other people because we're broken and we can't see our way out through our own minds. We need somebody standing outside the maze looking in to help you go the right direction. I'm going to get this right one of these times. Um, so building your program. Everybody you can involve, involve. Once again, if you've gotten to that place where you're ready to do something, letting people in, letting people talk to you from all different angles. A physician is going to be a critical step. If somebody you know is talking about getting well, a great step that they can take is to go to a doctor, to have a, just basic checkups to see where they're at in their physical self. A lot of people with eating disorders are going to avoid their physicians like the plague for as long as they possibly can. And you can talk to a physician. You can have them help. You can have them give your client some control or give your, your loved one control, meaning I don't have to look at my weight. I don't have to know what my weight is. You need to make your physician aware of what they're struggling with. They can help. Therapists. I can't, you know, uh, promote that enough. I believe everybody needs one person that they can trust, whether it's a therapist or a friend, but also they need somebody knowledgeable. They need somebody who can see through where they're at, see through their distortions, and help to guide them out in a healthy way. A support, and, and more importantly, they need a parent to be a parent. They need a friend to be a friend. They need the therapist to be the bad guy. That allows you as a mom or a friend to go back to just being the supportive person that you want to be and not nagging them or pressuring them in their life and losing the relationship with them that you want. Once somebody enters into therapy, then you don't have to be the bad guy anymore. The therapist can do that for you or the bad girl. Um, support networks and groups. These are wonderful too. There's nothing better than when a person sits down in a support group and they don't have to explain to somebody why they purge. They don't have to explain to somebody why restriction is fun for them or why it's thrilling for them. They don't have to explain to somebody why they need to stop at multiple fast food places because the people understand and they need that kind of understanding. They need to know, everybody needs to know that they're not a freak. There is nothing abnormal about them. They're struggling with something that millions of 
people are struggling with. There's nothing sick or crazy about it. It's one more burden that people carry, and it doesn't mean you're not a good person even while you're fighting off addiction. Nutritional counseling can be really helpful for people learning to eat. At the end of the day, what I find out with everybody across the boards, bulimics, anorexics, and overeaters, is that nobody knows how to eat. Nobody's ever really had real information, even though they'll know everything about food that you can imagine. They will know every calorie that is in every single thing. They can tell you about nutrition, but what they can't do is eat correctly. They don't really understand how to manage body fat in their body. They don't understand what drives their metabolism or healthy cal calorie burning. There are things they don't understand about how to satisfy their cravings and be okay with that. So nutritional counseling is a wonderful thing. It can really teach you as you're recovering how to eat right for the first time maybe. Residential treatment, people are fearful of this of course. If you've been early on in a problem that uh, in your anorexia or bulimia that's gotten so severe that you've been forcibly hospitalized, they will hate treatment centers. When I work with clients, I try to help them get a different vision of it. I try to help them understand that this is a tool that when they choose to fight their eating disorder, it will be their friend. That they can go there, talk to the professionals there, people will help them set up a thing that will help them. But if they're not in acceptance, it will be nothing but pain and fighting for them. A whole person approach. And this is something that I got started with when I worked with Eden. And what it helped me do is remind myself, like I was saying earlier, that your eating disorder is just one part of who you are. It is not entirely who you are. You are likely a parent, you're a friend, you're a coworker, you're a student, you're a, a niece or you're a granddaughter or you're a teacher. But you're something else besides just your eating disorder. We have to reduce it and take part in the other parts of our life and reduce the size of that eating disorder and remember and focus on making the other parts of our lives more bigger. So we squeeze it out. So we need to look at all things. We need to look at our emotional self. How are we talking to our inner self? That's a great place where therapy is really going to help. How am I talking to my inner self? Is my inner self telling me that I am no good? What people don't like when they come into therapy is I say, the, here's the first step. The first step is you have to like yourself before you get better. They don't like that. Because they're in their mind thinking they can't like themselves until they're free of their eating problems. But the truth is for them to survive the long recovery, to survive the ups and downs of it, they have to learn to like themselves first. Socially, we need to heal. Eating disorders isolate people from others. They isolate them from events, anything with food. They need to heal and they need to be social to help them recover. Physically, we need to have information, again, to help somebody understand what real nutrition is, what real health is, what it really looks like. When I tell people I'm recovered from uh, bulimia, or recovering from bulimia, and they see me at McDonald's having, you know, my Big Mac and fries, they're, oh, you're not recovered. You can't be recovered. Because I eat fast food doesn't mean I'm not recovered. Okay? Because I have a diet Pepsi doesn't mean I'm not recovered. And that's another thing that people will work on understanding is what does it really look like to be healthy? What does it mean about food? What it means is all food is good and there's no foods you can't have, and that's what it means. But that's a hard concept for people to understand. Um, spiritually, as Carl was saying, spirituality is the most important thing. It doesn't equal religion. What it equals is that when you're in this struggle yourself, by yourself, nobody can be with you 100% of the time. Our spirituality is what accompanies us when we are alone. 
when in those moments you are trying to find a motivation to break a cycle that is so powerful, it, it is you fighting your own body. And we need every bit of tools that we can find to do that. Our spirituality is a pathway that we can turn to when we are feeling hopeless and it gives us answers of why we go on, why we fight, why we're pushing to change. And you get to pick your spirituality, but you've got to pick one. You have to have something that helps you know that the fight that you're in is not just a person trying to fight with the toilet or fight, fight a, you know, a battle with a piece of food. This is you in a journey in your life faced with a conflict, a long, painful struggle, and how are you going to get through that journey and keep yourself motivated and inspired all along the way? That's what our spirituality does for us. It accompanies us. <laughs> okay, so a couple things here, and I'll go through these quick because we're going to be done by nine. There's a duality here, as you can see. Working with addicts, as I've been blessed with Don Farm, what I see is there is a powerful, powerful need for somebody to be accountable for their behavior, to be open, to be tough on the behaviors that we're practicing that are unhealthy, secretive, and not making us feel good about ourselves. On the flip side, we're supposed to be accountable and, and hold ourselves as responsible, but we also need to be developing compassion at the same time, not feeling that even though we're responsible, that we're bad or guilty or that having an eating disorder is 100% your fault. To remember that it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. So there's a development of these very two important things. As we were talking earlier, we have to work on emotional awareness, but at the same time, we need to recognize that habit breaking is a separate thing. You can do years of therapy, like many people have. You can figure out all the junk, the baggage in your closets, and your behaviors will still be kicking on. You can get it all done and then still have the same triggers and the same stimuli that make you follow through those patterns. Many people will report that the pleasure is gone, but the patterns remain. So we have to work on not only that therapy for our emotional selves, but we need a habit-breaking plan. How do I break habits? How do I physically go this way? How do I change this environment? How do I journal before I do something? How do I talk to people? The habit breaking is the actions, the things that we move and that we do. Failure and inspiration, as I was talking about with spirituality, this is not about success when we're going through recovery. It's about our failure. What do I do to myself when I feel like I'm failing? What do I do in that moment when I'm abandoning myself because I overate? What do I do in that moment when I feel like I'm losing control because I didn't restrict hard enough? When we learn how to accompany ourselves in our moments of failure and we can inspire ourselves to get through them, then we will begin the path of recovery. Willingness and acceptance, they're number one on the list. Again, a lot of you can even fool yourselves or people can fool themselves that have eating disorders. They can think that they're working on it. They can think that they're in acceptance. But what I recommend to them is being around somebody who's worked a 12-step, who can really help them see if they are in acceptance or if they're holding on to a reason to keep their eating disorder. We need to know that there is reasons to let your eating disorder go. For those supporting, you're not alone. Family and friends, you are not alone. Seek support for yourself. Learn healthy boundary setting. Get educated so that, as I was saying before, if you're feeling resistance from somebody, you need help with that. You need to have all the information on how to move that along. For those trying to recover, 
You do not have to do this alone, and you can't do it alone. You can do this. For those of you who have overeating and have dieted for years and years and years without success, don't give up. Find the people who are recovered and hear them and listen to them. And you don't have to wait until you're recovered from an ED to like yourself again or from an addiction. You're quite a wonderful person along with having an addiction. And you're allowed to be that. You're allowed to work on your addiction and still be loved, wanted, and successful. Now, I know I didn't get that all in there that I wanted to, but my main hope was that hopefully there's some inspiration in there for people to understand that inspiration is what will get you through ultimately. And there is plenty of treatment. And I thank you for your time tonight. I'm sure, too, if anyone has to talk to myself or Carl, we'll be right out there. Is that true, Carl? You stay in for a second? All right, thank you. All right,